Hi, this is Pastor Darrell Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Wednesday, October 23rd, 2019. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Forgive me, I've been, uh, even though I'm on vacation from my main job, I'm having to work overtime at my business. <laughs> Yes, uh, my wife and I own a business, um, plus working full-time at another job, plus part-time job and full-time ministry. Needless to say, I'm pretty busy. Schedule is pretty endless, it seems. So forgive me, haven't been able to make messages, but I uh, wanted to today. I found little time in which I could do it, so I'm going to do it. It's like 8 o'clock at night. And after I finish, I'm going to go work for about another four hours tonight. <laughs> so that's that's kind of the way it goes. Anyway, out of hot rets, uh, all options are on the table, according to Warren and Buttigieg, saying expanded Israeli occupation in the West Bank could lead to U.S. aid cuts. You remember the last president we had, Obama, how rude and cruel and harsh he was to Israel. How he made Benjamin Netanyahu wait in a room by himself because Obama didn't want to talk to him. Very rude, horrible host, uh, horrible ally. And now we have Donald Trump, probably the greatest friend of Israel ever. I mean, finally the president who said, hey, Jerusalem belongs to the Jews. It's theirs. Always has been, always will be. And just to show you that we believe that, we're going to move our embassy there. Finally, a president who did what he said he would do on the campaign trail. Because all the other ones lied. And now we're seeing the Democrats, left and right, talking about not giving aid to Israel. Talking about... Uh, using aid as leverage. So many of them wanting to do away with being Israel's friend. Out of the Times of Israel, Buttigieg says U.S. aid should be used as leverage to change Israeli policies. Really? So you want to use some money to change their government, to change their policies. When... The ones here in America aren't even working right. How about you do something here at home other than try to get rid of the president that we the people elected? Why don't you do something for we the people? That's what you were put in office for. So tired of these guys spending all their time and all the taxpayer dollars to just fight against the one that we elected. Hello, get something done for America. Um, it's interesting, I was... Um, talking to a friend today uh, about helping me on the project I'm working on. I'm remodeling uh, a restaurant space. <sighs> Almost got all the demo done. Now it's time to start building and uh, doing what we want it to look like. Anyway, talking to him because he had built something else in the other side of the cafe, but he's like, oh, I'm, I'm not at home right now. I won't be home for about a year because... I'm working on Trump's wall in Arizona. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. How'd you get that job? Anyway, I thought, hmm, where's, where's the media on this? How come we don't hear about this stuff? I have to hear it from friends. Hey, by the way, I'm working on the wall. I'm just like, oh, are they hiring anybody else? <laughs> um, out of world Israel news. Headline says, Gantz gets shot at forming government. Invites Netanyahu to negotiations. So after, after they had such a close race in the Israeli election, the second Israeli election, Benjamin Netanyahu was given 28 days to form a government. He was unable to successfully form a government. Things are slightly different in Israel than they are here in America. I mean, uh, you get elected as prime minister and then you have 28 days to form a government and you have to have like a majority government. But if a big portion of the other people in power or in the Knesset don't want to agree with your politics, then you, you fail to form a government. Well, now Gantz gets a turn at trying to form a government. Israel's former military chief, Benny Gantz, was tasked today with forming the next government. 
but he has few options after last month's elections left him in a near tie with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. So, again, Israel continues to not have a prime minister. I mean, they have a president, but the president in Israel has a different role than the president in America. It's pretty much the prime minister that has the power. So, <laughs> I guess we will continue to see... And understand something, too. You know, Donald Trump has always said he was going to um, roll out his peace plan, his deal of the century after the Israeli elections. Well, they were in September. Didn't work out well. They had to have another election. And now, a delay. You know, it's all God's timing when things happen. And this delay, I think, is part of God saying, we're not quite ready for that peace plan to come out. On my time. Not your time, on my time. It'll come out. So, we'll see soon enough when God's ready for it to happen. It will happen as we all anxiously await to see what it looks like. Out of the times of Israel, Iran barred indefinitely from world judo over refusal to face Israelis. In a judo federation, international judo federation, an Iranian refused to fight an Israeli. Said, nope, not doing it. The international judo federation said it had banned Iran from competition indefinitely over the country's refusal to face Israeli competitors. Wow. I mean, I would think if there was somebody I didn't like as much as Iran doesn't like Israel, I would think the people in Iran would be like, let me at them. Let me at those guys. I'm going to tear them up. But no. So it seems more like fear or cowardice not wanting to face Israelis. It's curious. Huh. Anyway. <laughs> so if you've been... Uh, watching what's going on in Turkey, Syria, Russia, Iran, Iraq, all, Gog and Magog, it looks like to me. Out of Haaretz, Bashar Assad rips into thief Erdogan as Syrian leader visits Idlib area, retaken from Turkish control. Syrian President Bashar Assad has slammed Turkey's leader as a thief as he made his first visit to areas in Idlib province recently retaken by Syrian government forces from Turkey-backed rebels. So Syria retook this area that Turkey had stolen, and now it's kind of like, what are you doing? This thief, he called Erdogan a thief who robbed factories, wheat, and fuel, and is today stealing territory. What's going to happen? Ever since Donald Trump announced that American troops were pulling out, Turkey has essentially invaded Syria. Out of Yahoo, Russia-Turkey reach historic deal on Syrian border. Russia and Turkey have agreed to ensure Kurdish forces withdraw from areas close to Syria's border with Turkey and to launch joint patrols in a deal hailed as historic by Turkey's president, Erdogan. Turkey and Russia reaching a historic deal. Wow. I just, I just keep seeing Bible prophecies popping up out of the headlines. Pretty cool. Out of Fox News, Trump calls impeachment inquiry lynching, claims process puts future presidents at work. If you're watching what these Democrats are doing, they're essentially working in secret, working in private, Republicans aren't allowed to see what they're doing or to respond or to question anybody. It's totally one-sided. There's no due process. There's no legal rights or any kind of fairness of any kind at all. President Donald Trump described House Democrats' impeachment inquiry as a lynching, claiming the way it's being conducted opens the door for future presidents to be impeached without due process or fairness or any legal rights. He said, so someday... If a Democrat becomes president and the Republicans win the House, even by a tiny margin, they can impeach the president without due process or fairness or any legal rights. 
All Republicans must remember what they're witnessing here, a lynching, but we will win. I think the more and more Democrats show us their true colors, the more and more less likely people are going to vote for them. So keep it up, Democrats. I'm loving what you're doing. Keep it up. You're showing us all your true colors. And they're not red, white, and blue. Out of Fox News, this is just wrong. Star says Dems doing disservice to America by shrouding investigation in secrecy. Ken Starr, talking about the Democratic impeachment effort against President Trump is being conducted under the cover of darkness to hide the facts from the American people, and it's just plain wrong, former special prosecutor Ken Starr said on America's Newsroom. He said, we're outside, we're behind this veil of ignorance because of the closed-door proceedings. There's absolutely nothing, nothing that needs to be done behind closed doors in these secret proceedings. It's a grave disservice to everyone. There's no doubt that someone's going to go out and spin or give some version of what was said. This is just wrong. It's unfair. It's no way to run this process. It's illegal. <laughs> Democrats playing a very dangerous game, insisting on secrecy. You know, when is someone going to speak up about the fact that they're breaking the law? Hmm. <laughs> you know what? Let's let's get into the word. This world kind of drives me crazy sometimes. First Corinthians thirteen, the chapter of love. First Corinthians thirteen, starting in verse one. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Many versions use the word love in place of charity. In fact, if you look up the word charity, one of the definitions is love. And being, being on social media as a preacher, pastor, I hear from people all over the world and I've, I've heard so many different stories and things happening in parts of the world. And, of course, I hear from a lot of people right here in America. Uh, I heard from this one lady who sent me this really long uh, email and was asking me to pray for them. And I asked her if I could share her story. Of course, I'm not going to use any names. Uh, but this lady was, was very frustrated with her marriage. Uh, she was not happy. Things weren't going well. Her relationship with her husband basically didn't exist. She constantly found herself lashing out in anger at her kids. She, she didn't know what to do. She was thinking, this is a failed marriage. It's as good as over. We just need to do the final show that it's over. Um, but then one day, she went to church by herself, heard about the love of God in Jesus Christ, the one who died and gave himself for her. Thankfully, that was the day the preacher preached that and not on some kind of new building they needed money for uh, or something like that. But he preached about Christ. And she went home that day and decided that she was going to show that same love back to her family. Love that Christ showed. She went home a changed person. Um, she started making an effort to really love her husband, to really listen to him, to really show him love, even when she didn't want to. She started loving her children with patience and kindness. And all of this was through the power of God inside her who enabled her to show supernatural love, even when she wasn't feeling it emotionally. And then one night as she was tucking her daughter into bed, a little girl looked up and said, Mommy, it's been so nice at our house since we started loving Jesus. <laughs> when I read that, I, I thought, man, that's out of the mouth of babes. That's perfect. 
that's perfect. You see, when you start loving others and stop being so concerned with yourself, starting with your own family, you'll start to see change happening. So I think we should all commit to loving others a little more than we do today. I mean, the greatest commandment, Jesus said, was love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second commandment is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So loving God and loving others are the two most important commandments there are. Loving God and loving others. I know there's a lot of people in our lives that aren't real lovable sometimes, right? I have to admit, there's probably times I'm not very lovable. Um, start loving others. Ask God to give you the power to express his love. Ask God to give you the ability to show his kind of love, even when you don't want to. Love others. And watch what kind of change you affect. If you want to change the world, start with your family. Start with those near you. Start with those close to you. Show them the love that God showed us. See what kind of change you find. In 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 10, uh, if I can find it, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desired to look into. You know, if you've read much of the Holy Bible, you come to realize divine revelation is rather progressive, right? It was over the course of hundreds of years that God provided man with indications of his plan for reconciliation. You know, that's why this passage that I just read, the Old Testament prophets could speak of salvation that we have in Christ, even though they didn't understand how everything fit together. It, it was this kind of like they're looking at a, a, a distant mountain range, but they had no idea how far it was from where they were to the mountain range or how far this mountain peak was from that mountain peak. Isaiah is a, a great example of this. I mean, he wrote of Israel's Messiah as a king who would rule over a restored world, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, a passage we read a lot around the holidays of Christmas, um, Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 10. But in chapter 53, Isaiah described this Messiah as a suffering servant who would die. Now, even though Isaiah wouldn't have been able to fully grasp the meaning behind the words that God's Spirit moved him to write down. Later revelation gives us a more complete picture of this. I don't think Isaiah probably was given account of what he was told. I mean, do you think they said, well, here's... Because if the angels explained it, Isaiah may have put different words in there. Might have said, well, here's what the angel told me, or here's what the Spirit of God told me. I mean, he wrote down what God's Spirit moved him to write. But I don't think God revealed fully everything to Isaiah. So probably Isaiah didn't understand everything he wrote down. Just my thought. I'm not sure. Um, we know Jesus came to sacrifice himself for our sins, to lay down his life for us, his friends, and one day he will return as the king in glory, king of kings, lord of lords. What's even more amazing is that angels long to look into the salvation, which we tend to take for granted and see merely as the doorway by which we enter into heaven. I mean, this kind of simplistic thinking reveals we don't truly understand the scope of what happened at the cross 
and how it affected our salvation. We should be curious, though, like all the prophets, who sought to know more about Christ and the, the sacrifice he lovingly made on our behalf. We should seek to know more, to learn more. When we make Christ that priority, we'll learn more about our Savior. We'll learn more about our salvation. And our, our awe of him, our love for him, will grow. The way we look up to him as Lord, Savior, and King. So many people, I think, have this flippant, casual relationship with God. And I find myself talking to Jesus as if he's a friend sitting in the passenger seat there with me. Um, and I've, I've asked God to forgive me if it's wrong for me to speak so casually to the one who saved me. So we should always seek to learn more about him. We should always seek to walk closer to him, to get to know him better. I mean, how do you get to know a friend? You spend time with him. That's it right there. You spend more time with him. John 1, verse 16, And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. You know, as a follower of Christ, a Christian life is not like some kind of insurance policy that only pays off when we die and go to heaven. I mean, every believer has now received the grace of God and the fullness of God. We're now complete in him. Colossians 2 verses 9 and 10. When we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're instantly changed in our spirits. 2 Corinthians five seventeen. A lot of Christians aren't aware of this change that takes place in their spirit. They continue to live within their physical and emotional realms and they're oblivious to this new born again part of them that has received the fullness of God. Right? Most people are more concerned with their flesh than their spirit. I mean, we, we get up, we sleep, we drink water to quench our thirst, we feed our flesh, we, we brush our teeth, we clean our fingernails. People take a lot of care of the flesh, but what do they do for their spirit? So many people, I think, aren't even in tune with their spirit or even feel anything from their spirit. I mean, you can't see your spirit. You can't feel it. You just have to believe the Word of God tells you because God's Word is spirit and life, John 6, 63. Your spiritual salvation is complete. There's nothing that can be added to it in your spirit. You are right now as you will be all throughout eternity. 1 John 4, verse 17. In fact, your spirit, if you've received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your spirit is just like Christ. That's what John tells us. 1 John 2, verse 3. Is it 2, verse 3? When he tells us, uh, oh, I got it backwards. See, this is why I go to it. It's 1 John 3, verse 2. Not 2, verse 3. 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be like Christ. Let me tell you something. Your born-again spirit is already like Christ. Hmm. So it's to the degree that we'll renew our minds to these truths and believe them that we'll experience this fullness in life. Because, like the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Proverbs 23, verse 7. So we need to pray the prayer of Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, and let the Holy Spirit reveal Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1, 27. Again, pray the prayer of Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 23. I will help you out with that. 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. That's our prayer. Getting to know the one who saved us and loving him so much that we let his love flow through us and out to others so that we can love like Christ loved and still loves. I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing. I'll see you again soon. Though I don't know if I'll be able to make a video Thursday and Friday. It's up to the Lord. Good Lord willing. We'll see. <laughs> Take care, guys. I love you.